West March Workshop presents the latest and greatest. All right, this one goes out to Archon. Yo, sup, fellas, got some hate mail here for Archon. Unlike your weak sauce parodies, I'll get my rhyme. I'm gonna nerf you harder than them condu with pylons. Did you even get the chance to put any units? Hey, yo, I heard you were gonna teach penguins Pokemon. I bet you switch in Pikachu against Ryder. After Warlords, yo, how much D3 did you log? My boy Lev was a better wizard. He went and found his dog. In all seriousness, yo, you know that you will be missed. I hope in your honor, Og Childs will exist. Exist. Yeah, and that's real. Let's start the show. All right, welcome everyone to <laughs> West March Workshop episode thirty-six. Gotta get them goblins. Give me the give me goblins. them goblins. I don't even know yeah. what I said. He's the one that titled it. <laughs> hey guys, we'll be here all podcast long. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you just heard that intro with uh, all. Mostly all credit due to Zyathis, who's a member of the BlizzPro clan. He wrote in uh, from between now and last week with some feedback, and he wanted to submit his own hate mail for Archon. And it just so happened to come in rhyme form, so I said, you know what, I'm just going to take it a step further. Put it over a beat. I had that beat laying around. It's a Childish Gambino uh, beat from one of his early mixtapes, and I just I just love it. So figured I'd lay down that track. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, pretty good. Although I had to sit here in silence for 30 seconds, remembering what it is that you had <laughs> sent over to me. Just like trying mm-hmm. to nod, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this is it. Yeah, it's a good thing that we have the overlay there. So that way you don't actually have to try and pretend <laughs> like I'm like listening to it at the time. You know, it's like, and then really prove that, you know, like white people have no rhythm. Ah, uh, there it is. There it is. Well, we were we're talking... starting. We're starting this episode off of racism, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to West March Show, episode thirty-six. <laughs> Give me them racists. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, but no, we were talking about improv before the show, so that would actually be a good start if you were pretending to bob and listen to the music. Mm-hmm. Oh boy, but yeah. So that's the intro, and here we are, another week gone by. Another week into patch 2.1.2. How has it been treating you? Uh, it's been treating me uh, fairly nice. Fairly nice. I'm actually, I haven't been playing as much as a lot of the other people in the clan, but I alone have been surprised with the number of legendaries that I've gotten dropped with my limited playtime. Um, you know, so sadly, the bracers have been the only upgrade that I've gotten so far. I did find a legendary. Um, Mara's shoulder, uh, Marauder's shoulder, is that's been the only thing that I've been uh, gambling on lately because that's a, a piece that I could really use a nice upgrade on. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it just it rolled terrible. It, it was you know it was one of those ones where it was, uh, like holy is the arcane resist with um, I think it was like life per second armor and some other things. It was just bad. Uh, and no, there's like no way that enchanting was going to salvage that thing. Well, something I'm curious about now that the DH uh, meta has changed with the set uh, getting its fixes, fixes, mm-hmm. if you will, in quotes, uh, do people roll or need sentry damage on their items anymore? Because I would imagine that would free up that slot in uh, your shoulders and your chest piece. Uh, it. You know, this is actually answering one of the questions that we had in the feedback section. Ooh, I'll, so I'll, I, I, we can, I can answer that now, and I'll just you know retouch on it once we get there. But um, prior, you know, prior to the Marauders change in two point one point two, sentry damage was your best source of skill damage. You mm. always wanted to prioritize that over anything else because if you had 15% sentry damage, it would also increase the damage that your spenders did by 15% when the sentry fired it. Right. And since the sentries were the majority of your damage, it was okay for you to go through and do that. That's not the case anymore, uh, because no matter how many sentries you have down, that will always be only half of your damage. So if you increase just your base damage of the, uh, like, say, Cluster Arrow, which is the main build that people are using, if you prioritize that, um, that will give you a larger gain 
since it will increase the damage of your sentries as well as the damage that you're doing. Um, the only thing is, there's only one piece of gear where those two overlap, and that's your quiver. Mm -hmm. Everything else, you, you can't have both cluster arrow and, and sentry damage on the same piece of gear, so you're fine. Cool. So I guess it does kind of open up a... Maybe you'll pick up... I don't even know what... Uh, I mean, for that, it really just would be, you know, if it was a piece of gear that you had that you wanted to get something like uh, vitality, armor, and all resist on the same piece of gear. But I would, I would think that um, the sentry damage is still going to be that best in slot for your shoulders, whether you're softcore or hardcore. I got you. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Cool beans. So anything else exciting either in the Diablo or non-Diablo world? Um, yeah, there's uh, two other things I wanted to mention. Uh, first one I was talking about on the last podcast that I had my uh, Warhammer Fantasy um, quarterfinals this weekend. Yes, yes. And I lost the game on the very first turn. What? And it was my turn. Uh, because I am just apparently really bad at rolling dice. <laughs> it was because I had almost my entire army in one single model. And I just rolled really badly. And it was something around, I think it was uh, 0.045% chance of happening for me to get the dice combinations I did because I had to roll, you know, I, I rolled something bad and I had to roll on a chart, and then on another chart, and then I had to roll one more dice. Mm -hmm. And it just was all these things and it removed that model from play on the very first thing that I did with it on the very first term. And I lost in the first five minutes on, the, on my turn. And oh, so wow. it was... It was soul crushing. It was literally soul crushing. So, well, getting trolled in RNG in real yep, life. Exactly. There's that. Um, and then on the positive side of things, though, last night I joined uh, Twiz, Eldorian, um, DJ Tyrant, and Balrog fan. A whole bunch of people from BlizzPro on Twiz's Heroes Power Hour a little video podcast that he does every Tuesday night about Heroes of the Storm. They needed a fifth as a fill-in, so I volunteered to go through and uh, jump in there. We had a whole bunch of fun. Uh, you can you can find that on the BlizzPro YouTube channel as well as the uh, Heroes of the Storm uh, or the Heroes Power Hour on iTunes. Uh, it's going to be under the video podcast. And uh, from what I just found out today, they invited me back to be a uh, permanent co-host over there on the show. So definitely hey. go through and check uh, check us out every uh, Tuesday night over on uh, Twitch.tv slash uh, Twizcast or find us on uh, the BlizzPro YouTube channel or on itunes yeah that's really cool i'm glad that they selected you at first when you said all those names like wow five people that's a lot of people but then it clicked in my brain there's five people on a team and heroes makes sense do you guys play the game at the time that you do the podcast as well Yes, yes. The the kind of the format that uh, Twiz has for the show is he picks one hero, and he's going to go over that one. So the first part of the show is talking about the hero, giving a brief like little video presentation of all the different abilities that that hero has, going through the skills and his personal favorites of how he likes to build that hero. And then we go and play games. Obviously, it's from Twiz's perspective, so you get to see how that that hero performs in a group scenario, as well as us just you know joking around and having fun for the next hour or so. Nice. I'll have to come and check that out. That's Tuesdays. Yep, every uh, Tuesday night, I believe, at ten Eastern, uh, seven Pacific. Cool, cool. You guys heard it here first, or maybe you heard it yesterday. <laughs> yeah. All right, so let's see. For myself, my Diablo play time uh, was pretty strong over the weekend. Um, I was out Friday, so I didn't get to jump right in when the goblins and all the goodness entered the uh, sanctuary realms. But I got home later that evening and stayed up a little later than I would have liked to, uh, chasing around all the goodness and trying to get those ancient items, of course. Mm -hmm. On Saturday, it's, it's huh. better to be chasing the goblin than it is chasing the dragon. Is that some sort of ah? You don't get it. I don't get they the even, reference. They even made a South Park episode about that. I, I don't watch South Park that much. Uh -huh. Chasing I'm... the dragon. <laughs> That's like just Urban Dictionary. It. Just look it up. Look it up. Chasing oh, the we'll dragon. Just, we'll, yeah, chasing. The, we'll just leave it at that. We'll du just leave it duly at noted. That. Duly noted. Yes. I'm sorry, and you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, so I was not chasing the dragon. I was out chasing the goblin. And uh, I found a ton of ancient items. Um, a lot of ancient weapons, too. But none of the one that I actually needed. Because this is something I was surmising out on the Twitter world. To see if anyone kind of agreed. But I didn't get any feedback from it. Which is okay. Uh, but I noted that the metagame for Crusaders would become kind of interesting. With the revelation of patch 2.1.2. Simply because... It's going to require for the Condemn build a very good Blade of Prophecy to take it to the highest levels that are possible. And that's one item, one weapon that really brings the build into its true potential. You could say the same for Stampede because it's going to be the Furnace that's going to be best. Mm -hmm. But if you have a Furnace right now, like a normal Furnace, and you find like an ancient, I don't even know, what, like an ancient Heart Slaughter, which would obviously be the second greatest option, um, an ancient... Uh, Sultan of the Blinding Sand, just some ancient two-hander, you're actually going to be able to do, likely, better than you could without that furnace. It's debatable. I haven't, like, you know, done the full theory craft on it. But just the fact that the potential for upgrades there is a lot faster um, mm -hmm. over the Condemned build. So I was saying that I, I foresee Stampede not only, like, keeping its popularity because everyone loved it before 2.1.2, but actually probably dominating the metagame simply because it's a lot harder to get one ancient well-rolled Blade of Prophecy than a bunch of other two-handers. Yeah, I feel that's probably going to be similar for a lot of other classes because um, there, there's so many different builds out there that are just a best-in-slot furnace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? And if if you have a well-rolled ancient two-hander to take its place, I I would like to see the, some of the theory crafting on that. I, and that's probably something that I should be looking into since I want to play a, a Jade Witch Doctor in Season 2. Because I know the furnace is the the creme de la creme, but uh, would uh, another ancient two hander be better if it was just obscene on its stat rolls? Right, like if it's perfect of the perfect, or even mm -hmm. if you could craft something too, because then that would be a nice leg up uh, early season. If you're mm -hmm. obviously chasing chasing the dragon of the uh, furnace, you're probably <laughs> using that wrong. <laughs> you, you need you need you really should look up that term. You really should look up that term. <laughs> I'm gonna stop using it until I know what it means. <laughs> oh uh, man. Well, yeah, that's it. Uh, I had the Monday off, Martin Luther King Day, so it was nice to get in a little extra Diablo time. But since then, I actually have not played, which is kind of weird. So it's been a two-day so, drought. So wait, your law office actually let you have Martin Luther King Day off? Right? This is this is the, the place of hell, the place yeah. where no fun exists, and they somehow uh -huh. gave us a day off that is not normally given to many other companies. Mm -hmm. Go yeah. figure. That, that, is, that is really, really strange. I can tell you, the we didn't... At the law office that I worked at, we had no federal holidays besides, you know, like Thanksgiving and Christmas. That was it. Wow. Yep. It doesn't make sense because when the courts are closed, you would think the law firm should be closed too. Oh, that's that's what I would think. But no, that just gives us an extra day to catch up. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Oh, man. No, I know that feeling too. I mean, it is nice. The phones don't ring and stuff and you can um, get on the backlog of documents. There's always a backlog of documents in every oh. firm. That, that is what their reasoning was for us coming in and working. Of course it was. Mm -hmm. But yeah, man, that's um, that's pretty much it. Gaming week. Weekend. Wow, gaming weeking. Weekend gaming. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta slow down on the yes. uh, Newcastle. Game and weeking. That does sum up everything. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Oh, boy. So we have a couple of news items that we did want to jump into. Um, oh. I can lead off with this first one. We'll By kind of we'll build in suspense here. Mm -hmm. um, so late last week, maybe early this week, uh, all the days run together, but basically all you need to know is that uh, Era 1 is going to coincide with the end of Season 1. And if you don't know what eras are just yet, oh. stay tuned because I'm going to tell you in less than a second. <laughs> <laughs> it is the end of an era. The end of an era, truly. Uh, the eras are, they basically correspond to the time on non-seasonal play when uh actually why don't i just read i should just read this huh i'm like trying to surmise it but i should actually just read the explanation here so we have in this blue post in diablo 3 an error refers to a specific period of time in which non-seasonal leaderboards are active that's basically what i was about to say uh, at the end of an era all current non-seasonal leaderboard standings will be wiped and players will be unable to attain new leaderboard ranks until a new era begins 
So similar to seasons, players will be able to view the previous rankings in game and as well as on the website. So all that stuff will be commemorated uh, in the annals of history forever and ever. And like I was saying uh, to lead off this piece, it's coinciding the end of era one it will coincide with the end of season one. And currently, Nineball wants me to just commit to this, but I'm still saying currently, possibly, the end of season one will be Tuesday, February 3rd. They have not said definitively, but you know. Uh, they have, they have. They said, <laughs> they said that the end of season one is targeted for February 3rd. Targeted. That, that, yeah. Yes. There's, have you ever targeted? This is this is Blizzard. <laughs> they have to live. The, they have to leave themselves, you know, a way out just in case something bad happens and they have to push it back. All I want to say is, Nineball, have you ever targeted someone in Goldeneye, and you go for the headshot and then you miss and you hit uh, them in the in the body and they keep coming at you and then they karate chop you to death? Yes. It could happen to season one. It it, it could, it could. <laughs> but uh, it's, since they haven't said anything else. February 3rd is still the end date yes. for season one. And we have some uh, things coming forward in other news pieces that seem to further add to your claims here. So, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. I'm getting on board. Um, but what's interesting is that Era 2, the next era to start right after Era 1, mm -hmm. as those things usually work, uh, will start right away, while Season 2 will be a little bit delayed after the end of Season 1. So if you're mm -hmm. ready and willing to hop into the next um, non-seasonal era, you could do that literally as soon as the gates close on Era 1. Uh, so that would be a nice time for if you're a seasonal character and your stuff all rolls over to non-season, you want to like leave your mark on those Era boards before you head back into Season play. Uh, seasonal play for season two, then that's your little window to do it there. Yeah, that that it is, um, and also just you know, I guess leading into that, talking about the end of season one, beginning of season two, our next big news item is that we have a we just found out today a live stream, a new tavern talk that's going to be coming out February tenth, that um, they are going to start talking about what they've learned of uh, from the seasons. This one's specifically targeted to uh, celebrate the start of season two. They want to take some uh, time to discuss the philosophy behind seasons, you know, what the lessons that they've learned, what they want to do going forward. I'm sure we'll hear a lot about the things that they tested or observed from season one, and maybe there might be some background changes that they have for season two. Hopefully, there's going to be some things like no major changes, no patches released in the middle or end of a season. You know, maybe a little <laughs> bit more transparency see with the the actual length that they want to have or that they're shooting for in the season and that is uh, slated for tuesday february 10th over at the official diablo channel so it's the twitch tv twitch twitch.tv slash diablo um, and that also itself leads into a little bit of speculating when it comes to the seasons because you know um we've we've both said that we've always we've always been expecting that se the season would hopefully start on a friday that's how they did with season one and that's what i'm going to continue to believe and last week we were talking about um i think i said that i would expect it to be on february 6th or february 13th mm -hmm. which is the friday or the friday after um that they do that and with this stream talking about what to look forward to in season two you know, that's coming on the 10th, that makes me think, well, they're not going to have a stream talking about what they expect to be in the season after the season releases. Right. So it's going to kind of cut out, you know, February 6th. And that makes me think that that February 13th is looking like a, a much, much better date for season two starting. Yeah. Uh, I want to backtrack very quickly um, to let people know the time too. So it, you're right that the live stream will going on uh, February 10th, Tuesday, and that's at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard, mm -hmm. which is also 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern. Mm -hmm. So, And then, of course, if you can't catch it live, they always do their VODs re relatively quickly, too. Um, and I'm sure we'll cover it on the uh, Diablo Bliss Pro site, so you'll mm -hmm. have plenty of ways to catch it. But yeah, that, that theory that you just brought up sounds, sounds sound, um, because it would not make sense to have everyone playing season two back, you know, the weekend before and then saying, all right, Hey, tell us what you're, what you've got planned for season two. Uh, so I think you're right, but much to my chagrin and perhaps the chagrin of romantics everywhere. That's, that's 
that's just bad timing, man. That's that's Valentine's Day weekend. Forever alone is the only way that you will be if Hashtag you want it. to break if you want to uh, break the leaderboards in Diablo Three. Uh, <laughs> it's true. It's like the true uh, testament to how much of a hardcore gamer with a lowercase mm -hmm. H are you? <laughs> are you gonna go outside or are you gonna stay indoors? I mean, in another another way to look at it is actually the developers just love us that much, you know. Yeah, like love of their yeah. own. Yeah, it's their love and their passion, so right. they they want to spend Valentine's Day with it. Right. So yeah, I guess we'll see. Um, I'm actually really in uh, invested, interested, uh, excited for this live stream because I really want. We've been speculating for how many weeks and months now, just as we've gone through season one and experienced it from um, moment to moment, and as the changes have come. Just our own, like what's going through their heads when they make these changes? Why do they roll this out at this time, etc.? Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to be great to kind of jump into the Dragon's Lair um, and see, you know, what they were considering at the time, what they thought were priorities versus, you know, kind of what the player priorities mm -hmm. were, and what they really felt was just like too either game breaking or too um, faulty to leave un unchanged before the end of the season. And I. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I hope that it'll help us determine, or at least get a better sense of what to expect going forward. Because I think, like we've been saying along the way here, um, the best thing for the community is more information. Kind of that transparency thing that we were talking about before the show started. And um, mm -hmm. I think if we just know why certain things get done the way they get done, then we'll, we'll be better equipped to, uh, to accept them. And so if something crazy happens during Season 2, then, you know, at least we can say, well, they explained, so. Yeah, and, you know, even if it's, I feel that even if it's a change that I don't like or don't agree with, if I can have a, a better understanding of what it is that led to that decision, you know, I can at least better accept it. You know, I might still not like it, but at least I can understand the reasoning of that change that was made without just being, you know, oh, we're doing it, we don't have to tell you why. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I think that was kind of that initial brush with the community. There was that weird divide between we are the developers, you are the community. These two people and things don't talk or interact, you know? It just felt mm -hmm. like that very divisive, like we are them, we we are us against the world. Or I don't even know how to describe, but yeah, yeah, I'm glad that it's been changing and much for the better, especially with these streams in particular. Oh, by far. And that was that's something that, you know, Blizzard as a whole is kind of shaking off on. They're, you know, around, you know, around 2010 um, and going on to that, once they started getting into Heart of the Swarm and Diablo 3, you know, had already been announced. Or not Heart of the Swarm, just StarCraft 2. Uh, the, all the development teams besides World of Warcraft kind of closed up. They made uh, kind of a barrier between the community and the devs. You had the CMs, which would be there on the forums and such, but they, they kind of locked down the dev teams. I don't know that whether that was just like an actual company-wide decision or individual decisions by the developers to be less interactive with the community. Uh, and then even on World of Warcraft, it was just like ghost crawl are out there doing his thing um and i saw that shortly after the release of starcraft 2 you know the community was always just like enraged because they would be doing these balance changes and it was always like blizzard what are you thinking this is so much more important and everyone you know felt that their own race was you know being uh, picked on or over nerfed or they needed better buffs and all these other things and so the, i saw that the starcraft 2 team you know started to engage the community more you know you saw you saw a lot more from the devs going and interacting explaining the balance changes and such and a lot of that you know kind of uh, the the vitriol died down considerably and so when d3 originally came out it had that same mentality that there was you know kind of like this impenetrable wall you could they they would do interviews with major press sites and things of that nature mm -hmm. but you didn't you didn't get to see what was actually going on in the developers heads why they were making that decision so it's something that's you know obviously has changed uh going into reaper and it's something that we're, we're a lot better for a lot of the complaints and things have died down considerably from what it was back in d3 classic and i think that a lot of that has to do with transparency i agree one of the big things that i feel 
kind of hallmarked when that started was the uh, patch notes. If you recall, there's something I always point back to was the patch mm-hmm. notes when they put in the philosophies for the first time. And I think it was something that Wyatt had kind of thrown out there to Nevelisis or whoever was writing the patch notes at the time to say, hey, include this to kind of explain why we're changing, you know, the Crusader's steed charge or why we're doing this, like what the what the intent is behind it. And that just opens up the dialogue further. So it kind of, to me, spark plugged this entire shift from, yeah, it's closed off. It's us like working behind the steel curtain to, hey, we're all here. We're all uh, equally invested. Let's all talk mm-hmm. about what we, this game that we love. Yeah. And yeah. actually, that's a great segue into changes. <laughs> I'm, uh-huh. I'm, actually, I'm genuinely like really happy uh-huh. about that. I, <laughs> so easily amused tonight. Um, so we have hot fixes that went live last Friday. Um, mm-hmm. And one of them was actually live on Friday, but we just didn't know about it officially until today. But if you were playing the game, you probably noticed that it was occurring. So the first one it was an achievement hotfix. And I noticed this one working because everyone that logged in basically got this achievement where they made it so that um, you're not the boss of me uh, was able to be procced, if you will, given to players um, who had not killed the Lord of the Bells. Because Lord of the Bells is obviously the, not obviously, but it is the uh, Cow Rift, Rift Guardian. And the cow rift is damn near impossible to get into even until today um Mm -hmm. i don't know if you have you seen it i have never seen it in all my time playing and that's insane because we both play this game quite a bit i've seen it Mm -hmm. once and i thought that was kind of nuts just i i have seen it one time and i played through it and like the ultimate troll like my first pair of tasker and theos you know being on the ptr Mm -hmm. i saw the cal realm at blizzcon uh what is it blizzcon 2013 what yeah that's actually hilarious Mm -hmm. and never to be seen again of course never to be seen again yeah, so they decided that it would probably be better to pull Lord of the Bells out of being necessary for that You're Not the Boss of Me achievement. And at first, it wasn't getting dinged properly for people, but they put that hotfix in, and I saw everyone get it, so it has to be working now. And the other, more interesting uh, hotfix here was, as we were talking about last Wednesday, Nineball kind of correctly forsooth, uh, the Conduit Pylon was just too weak it wasn't doing anything it was tickling the white mobs the it was it was like beating us over the head by the blue mobs they were just like hey give me that oh that's combat pylon i'm just gonna kill you with it actually so Mm -hmm. they decided to make it much better and it definitely i was feeling it for sure over the weekend taking out um elites again and actually a really cool anecdote to go with this is i was doing um three group three man greater rifts on monday uh, with Blaze and um, Thibbledorf in uh, the Blizz Pro clan. And we happened to get a conduit right before we spawned the Rift Guardian. And I felt huh. so dirty. Uh-huh. I felt so bad. I'm like, oh boy, here we go. Conduit you, boards. You cheeky bastard. Everything I complain about, I am about to engage in right now. Mm-hmm. But uh, it actually, I felt like it was working as intended because it only took about 25% of the life of the Rift Guardian. And that was with all three of us standing right next to it. Um, so getting off, you know, optimal shocks from the conduit pylon and everything like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, it did damage to it. It was significant for sure. Like if we were tight against the time, that probably would have helped loosen the uh, grip around our necks a little bit. But it didn't by any means trivialize that fight because we still had to DPS it down for, you know, the other three quarters of the HP. So, yeah, so it was a nice little, you know, nice that they buffed it, but not what it was, where it just instantly killed a boss. Absolutely. People are saying one of the changes to it, which I think I've been noticing, is that it ticks slower than it used to before. Like, it used to just update with damage quite a bit. That was one of the things that they did mention on the, the stream when uh they were talking it when john yang was talking about the changes that they had made to it in addition to reducing the damage that it just it um it will only i think it's something along the lines that it, there's an internal cooldown between how many times that it can hit the same mob oh okay so when you're going through like a pack it can go through and fire off and you know do a decent amount of damage but when it's just the boss you'll notice a, a distinct decrease in how much it puts out 
And that makes perfect sense, actually, because I remember one of the philosophies that they were stating when they made the initial uh, change in 2.1.2 was to have mm -hmm. it be better against groups and not as good against single targets. So, yeah, that makes perfect sense. You put a cooldown um, from when it can attack the same target again, then it achieves exactly that. Right on. Yeah. And that does it for the news i think we had oh, something else no, right yep there there's uh, one other thing uh we did learn this week that uh blizzard is going to be at the uh, the gdc the game developers conference is going on in march over in san francisco right. and uh the diablo 3 crew will be there they have two different panels uh one is going to be with josh and he'll uh, his is entitled against the burning hells well he'll be talking about the uh massive changes that went on from transitioning uh, d3 classic into reaper of souls i imagine a lot of that is going to be a rehash of the evolving reaper of souls panel that we all got to see at blizzcon um but it'll be interesting to see if there's any new any new details not really new details but additional details that they release about some of the the challenges that they faced in that transfer the uh the second one i think might just end up being more interesting in terms of like newer information and that's going to be uh soundtracking hell that has uh russell brower derek duke uh neil acri and joseph lawrence and they're going to talk about uh crafting the soundtrack for the expansion and you know what went into developing that which you know is anyone that's listened to like the soundtrack from d3 classic and reaper of souls it's like it just it, it jumped it, it is a uh, it's they're not even on the same level in terms of like the uh just how how much more it makes part of the game and d3 you know not knocking the uh the the music that they put into it but a lot of it's mm -hmm. just you know more background more you know just it, it's there to add like a little bit of ambiance ambiance exactly yeah but in reaper of souls it's it's a lot of it is a part of the level if you go through and play and you're going through you know like a, a map in the ruins of corvus but you know it it has like this really otherworldly feel to it and it's got some you know a, a lot more character to it I would agree with that. I think when maybe that was one of the earliest pieces of feedback when Reaper of Souls launched was everyone just talking about how good the music was, how good the soundtrack was. So mm -hmm. this uh, GDC um, panel in particular, I think will be interesting to the both of us. Obviously, this is something that you've always been interested in. I remember you showed mm -hmm. me that piece um, from Matt Yulman, if I'm pronouncing his last name correctly. Uh, yeah, Yulman. Yulman. Um, just about like all the the work that went into creating the D two stuff and the fact that <laughs> all the all that instrumentation was just like not even real instruments. Um, yes, so yeah. unbelievable. But I've always just been obviously with the parodies and whatnot. Music is a really important thing for me, so I'd be curious to see exactly what they talk about with designing that stuff. And maybe we'll maybe we'll get a little foreshadowing on what kind of musical stylings we'll have going forward when they add more things and areas to the game i would love to hear if they actually crafted new music for the uh, ruins of shesheron coming out in patch 2.2 mm -hmm. that would be amazing that would be really cool because that would actually be taking it to a whole nother level right like we were already talking about how cool it is that you know either they're using old assets or updating old assets or creating new assets mm -hmm. to add a new area to the game and just the level of um uh, what's the word just the, the the fact that that's so such a big chunk like it's unprecedented that that's been a, such a big part of a patch a content content of that size mm -hmm. um if they also if they also went as far as to add music with that too i feel like that's just yet another sign of that dedication of them really being um ready and willing to patch this game into perfection and not ne not necessarily needing to do another cash grab with an expansion before it's uh it feels too soon yeah yeah and yeah, just more because more. Exactly. Why, right? why not? Just <laughs> exactly. Throwing it out there. Always want more. Mm hmm. Um, I do think that about covers up some of the uh, big topics as far as news goes. There are some other like little blue blue posts here and there, but mm -hmm. uh, it's mainly a lot of stuff that we've either covered or you can find on uh, BlizzPro, uh, Diablo.BlizzPro.com for a lot of the little things. Yes, indeed. Um, I know that one thing that people were kind of pointing to was the lag that has been happening over uh, the weekend. Yeah. So that's probably something to quickly touch on. I think 
I mean, we haven't really gotten an explanation from any official source, so I'm not exactly sure. I don't think it was a DDoS this time around. I think it might have just been a perfect storm of people wanting to come back for the community buff and the patch being uh, brand new, because that was the first weekend, I believe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Of, yeah, of being able to play patch 2.1.2. So you imagine mm -hmm. there's going to be quite a bit of people interested to see the changes. Uh, couple that with the buff and then the fact that all those goblins i don't know if you got like the size of packs of treasure goblins in regular rifts that i was getting but like sometimes you would get 30 goblins and if you get aoe that kills them all simultaneously or if you pick up the new and improved mm -hmm. conduit pylon that kills them all simultaneously i mean the screen was doing weird stuff like the items would drop i wouldn't see any of the icons that would normally pop up and then i would yep. hit alt but like some of them would show and then some of them wouldn't and it was just it was really weird yeah with this goblin patch is the first time that i learned that apparently that there is a uh, there's a hard limit to the number of infor or the amount of information it can display for the loot on the ground because i encountered that very same thing as i had killed uh, there was a gym goblin that had died further away from all the rest of the goblins and i just wanted to go through and pick up the gyms and i could see the icon of the gym sitting there and the huge glow signifying that there's a ton of gyms all in just in that one spot, but I couldn't click it. <laughs> I couldn't actually pick it up. Even holding down alt, it wasn't coming up with the information and no matter how much I hovered over it, it wasn't identifying that there were items there. I had to go over to the rest of the stuff and just start picking up items before I actually got the tag of those items to appear and for me to go through and pick them up. It was an interesting little thing. Yeah, uh, it's so peculiar. So this is kind of the same. It almost brought me back to uh, flashbacks of 1.0.8 when they upped the density and CM Wizards were just like <laughs> breaking the game because you would see them like gather up a whole bunch of stuff and then it would do their freeze lockdown and you just see it go blip, blip, blip. Mm -hmm. And then like monsters like in like random actions, kind of like when um if you get a strobe light in a room and you're at like a sweet <laughs> dance party and you kind of see uh -huh. the person next to you like, I wonder if their face looks like this and it's so <laughs> that's what it uh felt like uh we were reliving over the weekend and it was weird because it came and went it wasn't like it was um permanently laggy or bad there were some times where i felt safe enough to do greater rifts because uh the lag had settled itself out but every now and again man it would spike back up until like 500 ms i know some people were getting like spikes of 2000 and whatnot it's like Ooh. basically unplayable um so yeah Pushing through those red bars, man. Trying to get those ancient items. Mm -hmm. Living life dangerously. On the edge. Might as well. It's the end of the season, right? If you die, what Pretty does much. it matter? Yeah. This is the time when you need to push it to the limit. That's right. Oh, I want that song. Push it to the limit. <laughs> da -da, da -da. <laughs> Sweet. All right. I feel, it feels like we're moving along at a nice clip here. We do have a lot of feedback, so maybe we can spend some extra time in here with uh, our responses and whatnot. Oh, definitely. Speaking of which, I think it is a good time to transition into that phase. Cool, cool. I'll start it off just by saying that if any of you listening out there in the YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher world want to contribute to this section, uh, feel free to send us email. The address to do so is westmarchworkshop at blizzpro.com. Uh, we are open to receiving all sorts of items, complaints, suggestions, ideas, builds. Look at your profile. We'll do anything. We'll look at your penguins. Um... I will definitely look at any of your penguins. <laughs> Use that as any sort of mixed metaphor as you mm -hmm. will. Go I for will it. chase the penguin. <laughs> I still need to look this up. <laughs> I feel like I should look it up before the show is over just so I can be appalled by the end. Probably. Probably. <laughs> I'll do that at some point. Um, also, was something that I forgot to mention the last show, but we do have our Twitter account too. And some people are actually tweeting items to us over the weekend, which is cool. But if you guys want to... Uh, Hit us up that way with shorter stuff or just some at the moment uh, ad hoc feedback or whatever. Feel free to do that. It's at the WM Workshop. And with that, do you want to take the first feedback? Oh, certainly. I'll go through. Uh, this one is, of course, from Ty Bud Subfellas. Um, and this is going back to what we discussed at the beginning of the podcast. He wanted to know uh, how cluster arrow damage is calculated for sentries and if he should prioritize cluster arrow damage over sentry damage. And, you know, like I went through and mentioned that at this point, 
you know, cluster arrow is going to be the best damage that you can get and the best for your build um, when you're playing with the Marauders set. Uh, but the only time that that comes into play is on your quiver. And, you know, with how many things that you can roll through trying to enchant a specific affix on a quiver, of all things, uh, go with either or, unless you just really want to spend like 600 million gold by <laughs> all means, uh, you can go for it. But I would kind of stop at the first that I got at either or. It's the only one that is ever going to come into question. Um, and I guess, you know, if it's one of those things at the beginning of season two and money is still tight, if you want to prioritize trying to roll a specific piece of gear to get a skill bonus, you would want to go for cluster arrow before you did sentry. It will give you uh, more bang for your buck with the way that the new Marauders build works. That makes sense to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cosine on that. Um, let's see. I'll take a suggestion from our good friend Mad Hamster writes in quite often it says sup fellas uh, you guys may already be doing this but last night I had an idea that proved to work out nicely I had found one of the new broken crowns uh, which is when a jewel drops another jewel also drops of the same type that's socketed in the helm um, and to clarify on that it's not so like if you put a royal you know emerald or whatever like the highest tier it's only going to match it at the lowest droppable tier so it'll be a marquise emerald if you put an emerald or a marquise ruby or etc um going forward with this email i decided to put an emerald in since i'm running a seasonal dh and i tend to use those more than others although diamonds are good too keep it in my inventory while running around and whenever i see a gem hoarder goblin i put it on as luck would have mm -hmm. it i ran into a pier during during the weekend buff and as further luck would have it there was a goblin pack nearby that they ran towards with other goblins explosion of gems and crafting mats and gold ensued and mm -hmm. also carpal tunnel session ensued clicking on all the <laughs> items yep but he ended up with drum roll please 200 emeralds when all was said and done from that just one encounter so his tldr for everyone is keep a broken crown in your inventory with the gem type that you want uh for whenever you get those chance encounters with uh the gem goblins because yeah you can just generate the gem you want at that moment uh multiples of that gem let the goblin run around they'll drop a bunch of extra ones for you yep and this is actually very interesting this is the first time that we've had it come across that um this thing that we got from hamster answers the question that we got from another reader that sent us in a question uh kevin wanted to know if you used a broken crown and killed the gym goblin will it increase your chances of finding that gym and you know all we already was going to answer yes but you know we actually had someone going through and writing in that yes this is this works this is a thing it's pretty convenient yeah and makes drop. it easy on us so please send in more questions like that where you <laughs> send in a question and have one of the other listeners answer that would uh, definitely help us with the show should be easy enough to do mm -hmm. just hack our account at uh west marsh workshop <laughs> um but yeah droth is asking if uh imperials can't be dropped and i'm not sure i don't in my experience i mean i only use it on the ptr so maybe it changed but when i was using it on ptr it's only marquise you didn't notice an increase in the Imperial gems switching over to that uh, to that gem type? Mm, not that I can Did recall. I, okay. Well, I, maybe. I, I would, yeah, I would think that it just uh, flips it so that way it increases the, the chance of the whenever a gem drops of being of that type. And so if you then rolled an Imperial, even though they're uh -huh. far, far rarer, that it would also just have that increased drop rate. Or I that see what you're saying. Of, being that type of gem i see what you're i guess saying. Yeah. yeah i guess that would be a question of how it changes the loot tables on the mobs right yeah i'll do some further testing uh -huh. on it uh before the next show and then follow that up because i would uh -huh. like to know i would have thought it would have matched whatever tear dropped yeah that would make sense we shall see we shall see do you want the next one Oh, sure. I'll go through and take the uh, the next one. This one comes from uh, Seb, another uh, European listener. Uh, or actually not a European. This one, He is a Canadian listener. I got that, sorry, got that a little bit confused. Um, that we just, we've had a lot of, a uh, lot of people going through and sending, you know, international emails. We're, we're going global here. <laughs> I like it. Uh, 
Westmarsh Workshop worldwide. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And uh, uh, he goes through. I'm I, I'm sorry. I should say that I'm guessing because it's his email address ends in .ca. So if I am wrong, which I probably am, let me know. Um, <laughs> But uh, Seb wanted to go through and kind of uh, talk on something that I, I think that we've talked on quite a bit uh, with the uh, the blood shard cap. Obviously, this is something that you know we keep talking about and people keep sending in their thoughts. It seems that a lot of people in the community really, really don't like the answer that they've been getting about the blood shard limit and want to be increased you know mm -hmm. even if it's just something along the lines of like 750 just something increase it slightly so that way we can go through and gamble for more items or at least it, it reduces uh the amount of times that we have to make trips back to town when you're just you know uh chain running rifts and you don't want to have to sort through all the crap in your bags and have to disenchant things and take it take the time which you know i guess it is a little bit weird because you always have those 30 seconds in between rifts because that's normally when what i'm doing in those 30 seconds is i just go through i spend my 100 shards you know salvage everything throw anything that i want into the stash and by the time that i'm done the new rift opens up yeah it's... Uh, the, the only the only thing is and i've not i've unfortunately still only had a single experience with is the new uh blood goblins right well the thing i think that they isolated with that was obviously we were talking about it in the ptr that you can get those blood thief packs and then oh my goodness it's a headache to take all those blood shards back to town to gamble them up but it seems like now you're very unlikely to to ever have multiple blood thieves uh next to each other or near each other uh, obviously outside of this double goblin uh thing that's going on right now but it seems their way around increasing it was just, hey, we're going to limit the blood thieves that you can never uh, find in quick succession. Um, you do still run into weird issues, though, where, like, let's say you have just completed a rift, you picked up your 90 or so blood shards, then you find a blood thief in the next rift, and that gives you, like, you know, your 300 to 400, and then you go and you kill the rift guardian on that same rift, and now you maybe might be over that 500 limit. That's a little bit of an inconvenience there, so I would like to see it go up. I feel like if everyone is clamoring for it, at what point can they continue to say no? You know? Um, but I don't know. It feels like yeah. it's the kind of battle that we can't even fight. Like, we've already levied why it needs to happen. Like, I don't even think we could find better answers or better suggestions or better whatever at this point. Yeah, like this one is just uh, keep uh, keep beating on the door till either our fist breaks or the door gives in. Exactly. Yeah. Um, let's see. Or is it uh, you want to take the next one? Yes, I do want to take the next one. So we have this one from Woody Tootie, <laughs> an excellent <laughs> name, and uh, he's changing things up here with a sub gents, a new year, new intro. Let's we'll see if that catches. Subgents, well, it's very dignified. Yep, yeah, we'll have to see. <laughs> While some of us are disappointed with the launch of 2.1.2 coming before the end of Season 1, what do you guys think of Blizzard's reasoning? Referring to their blue post stating, quote, We discovered some technical risks in, in, in executing a simultaneous launch of patch 2.1.2 and the upcoming season rollover. While they, uh, unquote, while they don't specifically say, uh, what do you think could have been the technical issues? Love the show, keep doing what you're doing. Um, this one's tough to talk about because uh, without saying anything that's weird or, uh, seems like uppity, um, there are reasons that they couldn't do it. I had it explained to me, um, by people close to the issue, uh, cause I was, I was being rather vocal about it and I felt kind of slighted by it. And so I kind of sought further info as to why it was done the way it was done. And it just really couldn't be done any other way. Um, so I think what happened was that this patch actually needed to be there before a season could roll. And what that means is that like the actual mechanic of rolling the season over is included in the patch. And so you couldn't therefore end the season before you launch this patch and then start the new season like the patch is actually part of the new season rolling in so um that might be part of the technical reason there and i think one thing that people were considering was okay well even if it requires the patch to roll the season why not just end the season as soon as you institute the patch but again they had given us that 30-day window that they said they would do it 
um, that they would uh, allow players to figure their stuff out before they ended the season. So they couldn't really go back on that. And unless they had already known back in December that they were going to run into this technical issue, which it sounds like they didn't, then, um, yeah, there was just no way to really anticipate this happening. So it, it was unfortunate. I still stand by the fact that it kind of sucks. But I'm having fun with kind of season 1.5, as we've termed it. Yep. Well, you made it to the second place on the leaderboards. I hope you're having fun. <laughs> <laughs> just by virtue of playing, of continuing mm -hmm. to play. I mean, it's cool. Like, uh, it's a new carrot to chase. It kind of, if anything, it's a preview of what's to come in season two. So it's kind of market research in a way of what's going to work, what's not going to work. And then, of course, throwing all the seasonal gems and potions and items into the mix to um, mm. make the stew a little tastier going forward. Yeah, definitely. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's the kind of thing where I feel like people will always feel like, oh, I wish they would have explained it better. And maybe they could have. It kind of harkens back to the discussion we were having on the transparency stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But I I don't know. I don't know exactly where I fall on it uh, without being too, like, up in arms. The anger is over. Yeah. Yep. I, this one, I guess, just is going to hopefully that they'll be prepared for season two with a little bit more planning where they'll have a kind of, I guess, either a mini pre-patch that preps the end of season or they'll you know they'll patch the end of season into or like the end of season two is already in patch 2.1.2 you know that mechanic is already there and they just have to flip the switch so that way they can actually end uh the season and launch you know the next patch more than likely 2.2 and you know we'll be good to go all right and yeah, I guess that's another thing. That's actually a great point that you kind of touch on is that this is a temporary, if, if anything, an isolated incident. So it shouldn't, <laughs> keyword being shouldn't, um, happen going forward. Mm-hmm. So Definitely. We'll suck it up for now. Would you like the next feedback? Yep, I will take the next one. This one is again from Ty Bud. Sup, fellas. Um, he actually sent in quite a few emails this week. I got... Uh, a lot of uh, feedback and questions from him. His uh, is a question about uh, some mechanics of the demon hunter, dif uh, demon uh, different demon hunter skills, and you know it's something that he was going through and finding. He read on the forum someone talking about the difference between the way that grenades and the uh, rockets or missiles worked, and what he was reading is saying that the, uh, the missiles or rockets from say like uh, Maelstrom would only hit a single target. So if there's only one enemy on the screen, you're wasting damage because all the other missiles that spawn will just not hit anything. Whereas if you had grenades, uh, they can uh, all the grenades can hit not only just the, tar the one target that the cluster hits, but will also hit um, everything else that's around it because it's a little bit of an AOE. And that is 110% factually correct. So um, if you use a, a skill uh, such as Maelstrom that launches off the multiple rockets, you can see that if you have just a single Rift Guardian on the screen, when you shoot that arrow, you'll notice the other missiles, you know, one will loop back, hit the target, and the other ones will just fly off to the screen. Or if you have just a Spitfire turret down and only a single enemy there, you'll notice half of all the rockets that are shooting are going towards it, where the other half are just going off in their own random directions. Uh, a single enemy can only be targeted by a single rocket from any skill activation um, at once. Um, so, you know, the grenades, even though they don't have the smart homing, they won't always hit the target, you know, no matter where it is that you fired. Um, they they can you know all of the grenades that are spawned by most of the other cluster arrow um, runes will all hit the same target in addition to all the other targets in the area. That's why you know even though that it you know the, those it looks like those missiles are doing a lot of damage you know from those rocket from that that little damage modifier only one is ever hitting the same enemy at any given point in time. So it, it's one of those where it's like your perception of just seeing the numbers it doesn't give you the full answer to how the mechanics actually work. Mm -hmm. It almost reminds me of uh, the lying character sheet that we always used to reference. Uh, mm -hmm. And the fact that, you know, you can't always trust exactly what your eyes are seeing um, because mm -hmm. some of the mechanics are a little more 
detailed or a little more hidden behind uh, further exploration. But that's some good DH advice right there. Mm-hmm. All right. I have a kind of longer one here from Thomas K. He's from the Europe. And he says, Sip Fullers. Oh, I'm sorry. That's not how you spell that. But then again, I'm from Europe. So, Og Child, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent uh. opening. Um, first and foremost, he's stoked that we're keeping the podcast uh, on the air, even without the betraying drunk Archon. Sorry, you know we love you. Um, and then he goes, this actually, I wanted to read this feedback. Um, I actually was wondering what happened to this one in our mailbox because I wanted to start with this one, but then I thought we lost it, but I found it. Uh, long story oh. short. It has a nice bit of suck it up Leviathan in it that kind of put my mind in a better spot in terms of the 2.1.2 stuff and, and just playing. So I'll just read it. He says, uh, seriously, Leviathan, you are and have been competing for top times on Greater Rift solo all season long. Now when you get a new chance to get higher, you throw in the towel. I know it sucks that you have lost your maxed out gear in the sense that there will be new and better stuff with Ancients, but why not seize this opportunity? It's like a mini three-week season, like similar to the racing season stuff that you guys have been talking about. So just get to the top. It's like a pro ski jumper refusing to jump again simply because the event manager had to lower the seat in order to make sure nobody jumps too far down. Stop whining and be competitive. <laughs> <laughs> I read this because uh, I was telling uh, Nineball I have the email set up to go to my phone. So I read this and I think I was at work. I just got like super. I was like, you know what? He's right. Like, screw this. <laughs> like, why am I being stupid? I need to get uh -huh. in there. So it has reinvigorated my play. So honestly, thank you for sending that in because um, it kind of helped make things make more sense for me. Um, he then jumps into the talking about competitive D3, the discussion that we had uh, previously. And mm -hmm. he says he agrees with the fan suggestion. Uh, D3 should be randomized every time, but for the scrims like 4v4, 3v3, 2v2, etc., um, they should all run the same rift, just a random rift. And then they face off against each other. It would just be that same one so that Blizzard wouldn't have to pre-create the maps or anything like that. Yeah. Um, they would just sync up, which makes sense. Yeah, and that was actually, you know, that's a, a suggestion that we've thrown around. That was something that Wyatt's talked about. I think he called it, like, the two towers. Yeah, when they originally or, talked about it at the release party. Yeah, and, you know, just you you would have two, te two teams enter, one team leaves, you know. <laughs> uh, that you would both kind of, like, queued up. You'd get matched, and it would pre-create the rift, and then it just both uh, releases you at the same time. And it was the first one to complete it goes, you know, or it wins. You know, so things like that, if they added some form of competitiveness to it, would be really nice. Because that, that's like one of those things that draws people in. You know, that uh, re when the seasons came out, we had the greater rifts that drew a lot of people back into the game. Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of they they got they got Reaper, they played it, they had fun, but then you know the newness wore off, and so they just left. You know, because it's like, well, I've beaten, I've beaten the game. I'm farming, you know, T6 and you know T6 rifts in you know five minutes. There's really nothing else to challenge me. They got greater rifts, and that brought people back. It's something that you could go through and be competitive with. You know, who got the best time, who got the highest rift. Um, but still, it, you know, uh, a lot of those people that came back for it left. Although I, I think that we're in a better place now than we were um, prior to you know, season one or 2.1. Um, I'd agree with that. Just a adding some form of direct competition instead of indirect competition is going to be that last thing that really hooks people and keeps it as a nice, you know, vibrant community, um, you know, through the, the lulls and the patches and such. So if we, if we could get something like that, you know, that, that would be great. I, it even goes back to just remembering the uh, road to BlizzCon. You know, mm -hmm. they, they had they had the StarCraft II competition. They had a Hearthstone competition <laughs> going on. They they were just having some, um, you know, just some show matches and Blizzard Heroes. Everything was going on, and then they had one guy that was like streaming Greater Rifts. You know, just it, it's nice that Diablo was included. You know, <laughs> right. but it's just like it doesn't compare. Not it at just all. it doesn't compare. You you know, it's like one of those things. It's like yeah, cool. You know, he's he's running it really fast, but it doesn't it doesn't have that built in mechanic of being able to root for someone and being like yeah, my team's winning, your team sucks, my team's losing, my team sucks. You know, it's, <laughs> you know it just like uh, it, it just adds a, a 
it gives you more of you know like a just more of that you know, like built-in interest into the game absolutely yeah if you get that kind of the storylines going the people to root for um especially if it becomes really like clan oriented because i feel like it's a perfect way to uh, integrate the clans and the social systems having a bit more of a meaningful impact um having uh the greater rifts have a bit more of a competitive impact and just putting all those things that they're jamming into the game with nice features to become richer and when you can mm -hmm. consolidate and mix all those things together and create those storylines bring something like that to blizzcon i think it's going to be unbelievably well received so here's hoping that um if we clamor for it a little loudly and maybe if we do exhibitions of our own obviously we won't be able to do like the perfect syncing of rifts because we can't guarantee it but even something that's just like a show match, you know, some clan versus another clan or whatever could be a good thing to just say, hey, this is how you could possibly do it. There's interest, at least. Mm hmm Definitely. Right on. Um, another part of Thomas's email, he tackles uh, reworking the Immortal King set because he's a hardcore player and he really likes um, the fact that the Ancients, um, my goodness, I'm blanking on their full name. Um, but the ancients that you can use as a skill, they give you some mitigation when you use a certain rune for them. And um, he wants it to be so that when your ancients uh, are around, you know, maybe they respawn or they're immortal. Maybe that's a little OP. But just the fact that they do provide that mitigation for a class that doesn't have um, a life-saving proc or a life-saving mm -hmm. passive, then maybe that's the way to evolve the immortal king set you know if you go to that five or six piece bonus make it so that you're not necessarily giving the barbarian a built-in um get out of jail free card but you're kind of guaranteeing them that extra level of toughness and maybe instead of making it mandatory to take that rune for the ancients that gives you gives you the 50 percent reduction of damage make all the runes unlock similar to furious charge with the raycore set or just other suggestions like that mm -hmm. And of course, yeah. there, I have to also, <laughs> I was just uh, scrolling down, I have to note that he also mentions the Blood Shard Cap. Just saying. Yeah. Just, just saying, just throwing <laughs> it out there. It is a topic of conversation that many people are interested in. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt. And many people agree on for once. You, it's not yeah. one that you see uh, people on the other side. Like, who have you seen anyone oh. that says, lower that Blood Shard limit? I think it's fine where it's at. <laughs> uh -huh. Just to be contrary. Uh, yeah. He is just a tack on to there. I think the the one thing that I've been seeing lately that might rival conversations about the blood shard cap is auto pickup on gems. Yes. Yeah. Let's talk about that for a second because yeah. it's being exacerbated and fully shown that it needs to be a thing with these uh, additional goblins and especially with the goblin buffs uh, going on right now. I know in chat earlier, people were talking about losing index fingers, carpal tunnel, <laughs> just serious <laughs> kind injuries. Of stress injury. Right? And it, yeah, no, if you were playing any at all this weekend, I'm sure any of you listening out there are feeling that pain of just click, 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 click to the ninth degree. Because yeah, if you get those huge drops like uh, Nineball was talking about, where the gems are just on top of each other. So it's not even like you're moving your mouse around and clicking. You're just in the same spot. Click, 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 click until it doesn't exist anymore. Um, would be nice to have auto pickup. Yeah. Definitely, and it ha it is something that the developers have said that they wanted to do. Um, I guess just the the tech's not there yet. <laughs> um, so it, that is one change that we can look forward to, hopefully in patch two point two, and not having to wait much further than that. Um, so that one is at least something that I do believe is going to be changed and will be updated. So we just we just have to wait for it to happen. This is true. Moving on. Yes. Um, yep. This one comes in from uh, Anthony. Uh, he first starts off that he is sad to see Archon go. Uh, he really liked the, uh, the th as he put it, the three-headed monster that we had developed. <laughs> um, and then just wants to say that uh, you guys, us, rock. And that uh, he's just, he's excited because this is the first time that he ever had a question of his answered on the podcast. Because he wrote in to us a little over a month ago, he had a lore question about the Scovo Siles and what was up with that. And, you know, as much as you think that it's, it's awesome that we answered the question, it's probably rivaled by, you know, every week that I feel that it's awesome that you're sending us your question. 
Yes. You know, as much as much as excitement that you have of us answering it, we probably mirror that with just the fact that you're taking your time to ask us. You know, it's just it is, it's just an amazing feeling of uh, people coming to us. You know, with questions, it's just it's awesome. So it, it is our pleasure to answer any of the feedback that you have coming in. Yes, you're welcome. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> No, seriously, it so never sorry. gets old. It's right. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, the first question he had uh, three things that he wanted to go through and touch on. The first one is he wanted to make uh, say he wants the story mode to have a purpose. Um, whereas I would kind of like that just from the the lore aspect. It is something that I think most of us have done thousands of times before, you know, when playing through story mode or doing looping out a certain, um, uh, like, uh, what is it? Uh, um, return to Tristram, you know, the fallen angel return to Tristram in act one, just doing nothing but fields of misery. <laughs> Honestly, going back and redoing that. You know uh, that I think story mode has like served its place, and the one of the reasons that the developers have given, which I I do really like, um, of why they don't try to leverage story mode anymore and everything goes into adventure mode is because it splits up the user base. Right now, everybody's playing adventure mode, and you know you can just go through and click you know uh, rifts or bounties. Um, and that gives you a lot of options to go through and play. If they go and make some something to play in story mode, it's going to split the user base. So now, you know, well, what is it? That it do I want to play bounties or do I want to play the story mode? Or can I go through and do this? And you're having to make those decisions. You're not seeing as many people going and playing. Probably not as big of a deal on softcore, but a lot of times you'll you know go on hardcore and you know on Torment Six you might only see like 30 games being played. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's one of those ones where it's they don't really want to diversify it any further. They do like um, the aspect of giving people a reason to go back into story mode and that was one of the big things that was behind the lore book conquest coming in season two is that you know that conquest can only be completed if you play through story mode probably a couple of times in order to get all of the books so that, that's something that they they might go and do with little things like that in the future that maybe achievements or um conquests that can only be completed if you play in the story mode and they're going to leave it at that they'll give you a reason to go through and play it mm -hmm. but not an actual reason to want to keep you there uh, the second point that he has, a very, very interesting one, is uh, why is Thorn's damage still a thing? <laughs> and it almost feels insulting that you have a monster with billions of hit points and they take 3,000 damage when they attack you. <laughs> You know, it just it doesn't make sense. Why is it still there? You know, you, you know, it's like, why don't they just remove it or make it be based off of weapon damage percentage, some form of weapon damage percentage, which is, you know, what it was in Diablo 2. Right. Uh, but it also is one of those they had that as the uh, the retribution aura for monks. You know, and it was, it was difficult finding a number that would actually reflect the damage back to the monster and have it meaningful because of just how much damage it did versus its own hit points. And is just you know if they made it to where if they it hit you and then you did forty five percent of your weapon damage back to it, you know that might be you know something interesting if like each piece of gear could roll like five or ten percent right. that might give it a little bit more better than a um, flat damage amount. Yeah, yeah, but this is also uh, like a question that I believe we've had uh, uh, Nevelistus answer on our stream and chat. Uh, I think even just like a week or a week or two weeks ago, something along those lines, we were talking about the Thorn set. That is, uh, the Thorns is not a type of gameplay that the developers want to really push forward, so mm -hmm. it's probably not something that we'll see a lot of buffs coming to, because it's a passive stand there and do nothing. If they make it a worthwhile stat, people will want to base builds around it, and then you'll have people that will go through and try and push it. It's not a, a gameplay type, uh, type they want to, um, you know, Encourage. Kind of encourage. Yeah, uh -huh. thank you. Uh, at all. So that's that. That is probably going to be the answer for that one. Uh, and then the third one is he actually forgot what his third point was, but then he wants to share his Demon Hunter build, uh, which uh, a brief uh, lowdown on that one is just it is a uh, 
uh, it is a cold build, um, and it's just using the Ring of Royal Grandeur to swap out the shoulders in order to get the uh, Og Childs, Og Guilds set. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so, that, yeah, that's the, that's the build that he is going to be rocking going into uh, Season 2. I dig it. Mm-hmm. Cold, cold DH is on the rise. Um, cool. All right, so there's that one. I think there was one other that I wanted to get into. Oh no, you did that one already. Uh, oh, there's this space stash stash space. Wow, I can't even speak anymore. Um, another one from the Mad Hamster. I like that he has his own title for his emails to us too, called Hamstergrams. Yep. <laughs> Love it. That's when you know you're doing it right. Um, he's talking about stash space in this one and just basically pointing out that the limitations that have been stated by the developers as reasons why they don't really want to increase it seem to be confounded by the fact that there's seasonal and non-seasonal because you're basically doubling the stash space there with the two different modes. Um, so he's basically saying that there are effectively more tabs if you start seasonal characters and then have it roll over to non-season and back and forth, etc. Um, mules are essentially extra stash tabs, um, but they're only accessed when a character is loaded, and it would be nice to see those across all characters so you can manage this stuff more readily. Um, <laughs> he says hamsters are hoarders, you know. This is true, we are all hoarders mm -hmm. as well. Um, I do, I, if we're not going to get more stash space, then it actually would be really cool to be able to see what's on all your characters, kind of like in an overview, if you could see all of their uh, inventories. Because I remember when the auction house was a thing, a really quick way for me to uh, see what was on my mules was just to go to the auction house, um, select the character, and then see, obviously it would show you what you were wearing, so you could kind of like um, see if you wanted to sell any of that stuff. Oh, I think you couldn't sell an item that you were wearing. But mm -hmm. it would also show you what was in your stash, or sorry, what was in your inventory, and you could sell stuff straight out of the inventory. So it was a very quick way of going and looking through, you know, your last five characters that you don't play but have stuff in the uh, inventories. Mm -hmm. So some sort of interface like that coming back would be cool. Definitely would be. Uh, that's one of the, that's one of those ones where it's that little voice in the back of my head says this is what add-ons are for but obviously we don't mm. we, we can't do that in diablo that's a bad word here yeah it's a bad word here because that, that's one of the ones where you know in world of warcraft that they've made add-ons so you can do that you can view what's in your stashes on your different characters um and it's just you know it's add-ons are there to fulfill um, holes in the UI that players need that the developers don't have the time to dedicate resources to. But, you know, it's not the type of game that Diablo is, unfortunately. All right. So we kind of have to see if it becomes a thing. Cross yep. our fingers. But, yeah, I mean, that that is a good workaround, I suppose. If you're... I guess it works better the other way. So as seasons progress... I mean, it depends kind of on the type of player that you are too, because if you don't care about non-seasonal, then you're not going to care that you have those extra spaces that you gain as your seasonal characters roll over. But if you're going to play both modes, then you can kind of say that you're stashing stuff on seasonal characters for your non-season eventually. But in a way, like, it doesn't really matter because it's still a character space, like, it's still a slot that's being taken. You still have a finite amount of character slots, so... Mm -hmm. Um, but that was that was the last feedback that I wanted to take. Were there any others that you wanted? Uh, no, I think that about sums it up. Sounds good. Wrap up the feedback. All right. Um, that would then bring us to the items of the week. I, again, just want to take the opportunity to plug the fact that we will... Um, we'll be getting some good feedback, too, from people saying that they're excited about uh, when we'll do the builds, looking at people's builds and kind of... Um, giving advice as to what direction to take a build in to make it more powerful or to make it perhaps more interesting um, or just helping people get to higher, greater rifts, etc. So that is a, I almost said that, that is a service that we will be providing, but <laughs> that's something that we're looking forward to doing once season two starts up and once people get um, along the way to building their characters, if you guys just want to submit your profiles or kind of like what the theme is that you're going for, what your goal is. Um, and hopefully we, between the two of us, will have ways to get you 
on your way to where you need to be, whether it be, you know, seek this certain set of items, reroll these uh, pieces to have this a fix or whatever. Just using a consortium of minds to improve all. Mm -hmm. And with that, I'm going to roll into the items of the week. Here we go. All right. So this first one is actually not the first one that I wanted to show. <laughs> um, it, what we're looking at right now is a little bit of a blurry uh, picture of a Wand of Woe. It is an ancient Wand of Woe. And uh, because it's a little blurry, I'll go ahead and tell you that it's 3022 DPS. Uh, it's been re-rolled for an uh, enchantment of 10% damage. There is some intelligence on there and 7% attack speed. And it has a Ramalada Dama 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 uh, to get the socket on there. So pretty mm -hmm. tasty. Not two shabs. Um, Not at all. No, no, no. And I actually wanted to highlight this one. Oh, I should say who sent it in too, shouldn't I? Credit where credit's due. Uh, maybe. maybe. Nah. nah, who cares? Nah. It's just a wand. It's just an ancient wand of woe. Um, oh. This one was submitted via Twitter from at Kato Pipe 4. So thank you for sending that in. And the reason I wanted to highlight it was just because, um, a, it's an example of, yeah, the rarest items are certainly not quite as rare as they used to be because if you're finding an ancient Wand of Woe when most people just couldn't find a Wand of Woe in general before, this is a pretty good deal here. Um, so yeah, they're they're dropping, and they're dropping well. I'm going to go backwards. Um, this is the Gloves of Worship, uh, an ancient version of them, and these were submitted by... Uh, I'm sorry... My, my order is just all messed up. This was submitted by 10 out of 10. As this was also a Twitter submission. And they're near perfect gloves of worship. Uh, again, ancient. 999 dexterity. Mm -hmm. Critical hit damage at 50%. Uh, Rerolled for critical hit chance at 10%. And then uh, reduces cooldown of all skills by 7%. So that could be an 8%. And a secondary of arcane resistance, 197 um, I wanted to highlight this one just because it's an example of, yes, bounty items can be ancient, just in case you were still skeptical, and they can roll very, very well, so. Yeah, those, those are one of those ones that you're going through, you're gearing yourself, you haven't completed your set yet, you're just going and getting items together, running some bounties um, in normal and such, and you come across that. That, that is probably one of the best things that you can find while you're still building your set in the early part of a season. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, we're at the end of the season now. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that, that those are just beautiful. I remember when Gloves of Worship were like, everyone was like, oh, it's the best item in the game. You yes. Know? Yeah, and so. Really early on. And it also yeah. helped that uh, there was a little bit of a bug there where the, which shrines was it? The cooldown reduction one. Yeah, it still lasted an hour. It was a holdover from the beta. Mm-hmm. Emp uh, the empowered shrine and then i think there was one other one too but yeah that was kind of nice uh, as a crusader early on because obviously you want cooldown reduction as a big part of your set there or as a big part of your um stat priority so i was able to do some things i normally wouldn't do with that bug <clears throat> and we're moving on uh <laughs> we're gonna look at this ancient uh wow what is this cinder coat <laughs> like what am i even looking at right now this is an ancient cinder coat it was submitted by jin lee and I pointed this one out just because um, perhaps my good buddy here, Nineball, could speak to it. But I wanted to see if you've been noticing any changes in terms of with Tasker and Theo dropping out of the metagame for DHs, what people have been leaning towards. Um, I think uh, some, of the, some of the big things that people have been doing is switching back over to using the, uh, the three-piece Og Childs. Sorry, Og Guilds, I'll say it correctly. <laughs> um, as you know, the cold has been one of the big ones um, up, up at the top. Fire has also been insanely popular. Uh, that one, most people have been going towards the Cinder Coat, um, though Mage Fists have also been pretty popular. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Cinder Coat is just nice because not just for the the increase in damage, but because of the decrease in the cost. Because Cluster Arrow just costs so much hatred that this uh, increases your effective DPS considerably. Right, yeah, because yeah, you can just get more of those spenders out. Mm -hmm. Makes sense to me. And uh, it's what do you know what language this is? Can you read that? Uh, I do believe that that is German. Nice. 
Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's uh, a, a cinder coat that was sent to us in German from Jin Lee. Thank you again for submitting this. Um, but it's got 20% for the fire damage uh, roll. Uh, I can barely read it, but I think it's 542 for the dex and 539 for the vit. Uh, and... 642 for dexterity, 639 for vitality. Oh, those are sixes. Excellent. Yep. And then well, uh, it's it's just it's the you know the Diablo thing. You you can't tell the difference between five and fives and sixes. I mean, I couldn't tell the difference between fives and sixes my whole life. <laughs> so I've been giving people six dollars for the five dollar mm-hmm. footlongs all along. Crickets. All right. Well, <laughs> uh, uh, moving on. Also, this has the thirty percent um, reduction for the uh, resource cost that you were talking about. But we'll just move right along. I uh, forget that joke was ever made. Uh-huh. Uh, we have here a furnace, and this is actually the first item that I wanted to start with just because it's not ancient. It's just a really well rolled furnace, and I kind of wanted this to hallmark the last, perhaps the last time that we'll um, show something like this. Because we got a ton, by the way, I think we mentioned it, a ton of items of the week. So it was really hard to um, pick through and, and select ones that were worthy enough. Because I know I, I issued the challenge last week. Uh, of you guys showing us your best of your best and you guys really stepped up so thank you again for all the submissions but when you see a good furnace you just got to showcase it ancient or not so this one is 3000 of course right Mm -hmm. this one's 3834.8 dps um that's with a nine percent damage roll that was enchanted on there 1090 int and uh, also attack speed boosting it up too so you have that going for it as well and uh Ramalani's for the socket but also the perfect 50 percent for damage against elisus it's legendary power just a really nice furnace can't, mm-hmm. can't complain i'm gonna go ahead and jump back through all these other ones that we saw and this one i highlighted specifically for shepherd who's uh part of the bliss pro clan he's always playing this game and he is on a quest to find I think he wants the Spectrum, but he also will settle for a Hamburger, too. And these are items that are specifically found in Whimsyshire slash Whimsydale. Uh, and he is, it's like his, um, what's it, the White Whale, you know, like his Moby Dick. Yeah. He just cannot ever find them. And he spends more time in there than anyone should. I don't, I just don't know how you can farm that area, friend. But um, this is an ancient uh, Horodric Hamburger. And this was, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. That, that the ancient hamburger is the one thing that I think that should actually be less effective because that just does not sound right. <laughs> it's make you sick to your absolute mm-hmm. stomach to just super cramps. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, hopefully Doodles, who submitted this, is still alive after consuming and using this. Uh, it's got a 10% damage roll that he enchanted on there, 983 dexterity, 6% uh, cooldown reduction, and of course he's got the Ramalama Namana for the uh critical hit damage gem that he socketed in there so this is this is awesome it's 2801 dps yeah this this that that's a burger that'll take a bite back <laughs> yeah this burger bites back <laughs> damn damn um i also didn't mention previously that the furnace was submitted by jeff so thank you jeff for that next up I don't know why, but just when you said previously, my my first thought just went to previously on X Men. X Men of all things. I don't know. It was just the first thing that came into my head. All right, roll with it. <laughs> um, let's see. This is a Blade of Prophecy of the Ancient Variety, and I included this. It's not even the best Blade of Prophecy, but I included it because the salt and the jealousy is so mm-hmm. real right now. Um, I was telling Nineball before we started that I sought high and low for an ancient Blade of Prophecy. I think I encountered 12 Blades of Prophecies that could have potentially rolled ancient, and none of them did. None of them were even upgrades. None of them were any good at all. It felt like a slap in the face every time I ID'd them. But mm-hmm. uh, our good friend... Oh man, I'm so bad on the names tonight. Our good friend... Uh, where is your name? I'm so sorry. Uh, Doctor... or Wow, it's not Doctor. It's Dark Lighter. But it's D-R-K-L-I-T-E-R. You could see it could be Dr. Kleiter. Uh, he submitted this ancient Blade of Prophecy via Twitter. He's also part of the Bliss Pro clan. When this uh, happened to sneak into the clan chat as something he looted, when the alert went up, I basically uh, walked away from the computer. 
<laughs> that was so bad. He was in the middle of a rift. Yep. He just yep. could have could have died. Didn't care. <laughs> nope. Didn't care. Didn't care. And the stats on this bad boy are four thousand forty two point eight deeps. Just absolutely ridiculous. Um, 1,449 vit, so that's a bit unfortunate. Probably want that for strength. And nothing has been re-rolled on this, by the way, so he still has uh, some leeway to work on this. Uh, next up is 35,217 life per hit, and then reduced cooldown of all skills by 7%, which is a little on the low side. But well, it's a but free... That, yeah, that is the skill that you want as a Condemned Crusader, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You just would have to make up for the other percentages uh, somewhere else. You would maybe wear like a... Um, the belt that gives you the vigilante belt that gives you some uh, CDR there as well. Mm -hmm. But oh man, so jealous. So congrats, Dr. Clyder, Dark Lighter, or however you want to call yourself. You're just awesome. I call you that. All right, next up, Donetta Spite, a little DH showcase here. This one was submitted by Mad Hamster. Uh, or was it? Nope, just kidding. It was submitted by Zordon Zig. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Donetta Spite, Ancient. Uh, three thousand two hundred sixty-three point four DPS. Uh, he rerolled the base damage on there to push it up higher. He's got nine hundred thirty dexterity. Uh, increase attack speed by five percent. Reduces all resource cost by ten percent. And I uh, showcased this one because he actually asked in his email to you, Nine Ball specifically, if you thought of any builds or things that would work well with uh, Donetta Spite. Um, there's nothing really that focuses around Donetta Sprite, uh, Spite, <laughs> Donetta Sprite. Donetta Sprite. Yeah, uh, that focuses around that. That will be the offhand for the uh, Roger Hamburger, Donetta Sprite. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just he, got that. He, he just got it. He yep. just got it. Keep up. Keep up. Come on. Um, Blame the Newcastle. Yeah. <laughs> there is a. Uh, there is nothing really. Um, focused around the Donetta's set uh, besides uh, trying to go for the one hour conquest of beating the whole game in one hour. You absolutely have to have that set as a demon hunter in order to be competitive with those clear times. I mean, other than that, if you're still like working towards getting yourself something like a Kryder shot or the Taru um, or a Calamity, that is a very nice fill-in until you get one of those other items. Absolutely. Yeah, it'll get some demons dead for sure. Uh -huh. He also submitted a second item that's popping up on your screen any moment now. Uh, the Mortal Drama, an ancient version. 4,295.1 DPS. Uh, he again rerolled the base damage here to get that pumped up. 7% um, damage uh, as an affix. 1,276 strength. And then reduce all resource costs by 9%. Um, again, this is the one that uh, doubles your bombardments and he wanted my opinion on a possible build for this. I'm actually looking forward to this item uh, next season because we'll also get the belt of the Trove for Crusaders, and that's what gives you your free bombardments um, every couple of seconds. The seconds is the, the part that varies on that item. But uh, looking at that in the future, I feel like this could do some cool things because it will double that proc on the belt as well um, when you use it yourself. So mm -hmm. you can just have a ton of bombardments always coming out. Um, and there are definitely some some skills that synergize with it. Like you have the passive of Lord Commander, which just bumps up the damage of bombardment um, outright. Uh, you can also use like impactful bombardment with um, as the rune on that, just to have insane damage. And then at that point, you would want lockdown just to make sure the mobs don't move out of your bombardments when you call them down. So there's there are a couple of things you could do. I definitely would like to highlight a build. Um, so look forward to that in maybe a couple of weeks lastly i want to say is a crider shot and this is actually from mad hamster uh it's an ancient crider shot he says it's not even all that good whatever it's three thousand yeah. <laughs> right it's three thousand two hundred ninety nine uh dps uh ten percent damage was the uh enchanted affix here and 904 dex 916 vit ramaladnis uh to give it a socket your thoughts on this my friend uh, that is a, that is a very very beautiful bow. That is very beautiful. I I am in fact jelly. Um, although mine you know is much lower in terms of DPS, 
mine causes my elemental arrow to generate four hatred per shot, so. Oh. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so take that, uh, mad hamster. Uh, other than that, I mean, who who cares? It's a freaking, you know, that's a almost a 3.3k Kreider shot with the dex in vitality. Uh, that thing is amazing. Absolutely amazing, yeah. And that's, yep. um, if I, correct me if I'm mistaken, but that's pretty much one of the best bows that you can get uh, going forward into the new Marauders metagame? Uh, it, it is definitely up there. The Atreyu is probably still the best for the cold build, mm -hmm. uh, just so that way you get that extra 20% uh, cold damage on your skills running. But if you wanted to run a fire build, this is probably your best in slot. Gotcha. Cool beans. I think... Yes, that's it for this, but wait, there's, there's more. more. There's one more that Nineball wanted to call some special attention to. Mm -hmm. I pop it up on your screen right now. Um, this was a funny email um, that came in. Do you remember who sent it? Because uh, I do. To... I got you. Yeah. I, it was a setup. It was Devin, uh, <laughs> it was Devin Miller. He uh, sent in his... Um, incense torch and he asked i am not sure which daibo i should use please advise yeah, yeah please advise and it's a friggin ancient incense torch of the grand temple 4357.8 oh. dps uh he enchanted nine percent damage on there as an affix 1360 dexterity spirit regen um increased by 4.93 per second and then you know some uh, wave of light damage uh, by 26 percent and the <sighs> cost spirit cost of wave of light just reduced by 47 percent. no big deal yeah no big deal at all <laughs> with the uh the changes that came to the sun wuko build that this item has been seeing a lot more popularity um and it is it is just that combined with that i can only imagine i want to see some screenshots of what your bells are hitting for because mm. you know whenever i eventually return to the monk wave of light is my favorite skill and i just this makes me just want to go say screw it i'm playing my monk you know i don't i don't care about anything else just the fact that i see that something like that exists mm. and it is so beautiful that's sick. And that gameplay, that game style looks a lot better. Um, just watching some monks do it on uh, streams and whatnot, it seems mm -hmm. a lot uh, more inviting uh, in terms of just wanting to play that style. And I know that Thib um, was complaining a little bit. He said he felt like a crusader without all the bells and whistles, but maybe that was just the adjustment period of getting used to the new uh, Sun Wuko. But yeah, it yeah. looks it looks like fun. It kind of made me want to play a monk after seeing. I'm like, wow, that weapon though. And it, I mean, it just it rolled perfectly because not only did he get the, uh, um, you know, it, he had to re-roll for the the weapon percent damage, but then he got the spirit, you know, and he got a, a decent roll on the spirit as well. Um, just made it all the more beautiful. Completely you know. agree. Ah, mm -hmm. uh, Devin's got spirit. Yes, he does. <laughs> How about you? Yeah, I screwed that up. <laughs> well, you can tell that we've gotten to the end here. We've survived another show somehow, some way. Nineball hasn't reached through the screen and killed me just yet. Um, was there anything that you wanted to leave off on? Uh, no, I think that about covers it uh, Covers it all. You know, as always, we, we thank you for uh, tuning in live or you know, listening to us on YouTube or following us on iTunes. Um, I guess one thing that we should mention um, as far as where you can find future episodes going yes. forward on YouTube, uh, will you still be posting them to your channel? I'm going to do both because it's easier for me to, like, after we finish tonight, just say, boom, pop it up on my channel, and then I can do the edited slick version uh, going up on BlizzPro over the weekend so that way people can get it as fast as possible. Yep. Um, but then you also will be... Uh, West March Workshop will be going home, as it were. Uh, we will be posting all of the episodes back up on the uh, Blizz, the official Blizz Pro channel. That's right. So you'll be you'll be able to once again find everything from the uh, the Blizz Pro series of websites, you know, on Blizz Pro. We were the one outlier. You know, we, we were the one that that didn't that, uh, that didn't post to the home site. You could say we're the bad boy of the site. Uh huh. Just yeah. rebels without a cause. Mm hmm. You could say so. 
Uh, but yeah, so you can, uh, whether you look for SA Stewart 1, you can find the earliest version on YouTube. And if you look for Bliss Pro, you can find the, the glitziest version. Uh, but either way, you'll be able to catch that. Uh, Re reliving the awesomeness of the live show here of course itunes stitcher for your audio ears and yes uh yeah uh and uh, speaking of itunes and stitcher we definitely would appreciate your feedback if you want to leave you know a review or a comment uh for the show um through itunes or stitcher it would really help us uh, a lot and it's something that we do really appreciate if you could take the take the time to go through and give us a like over there Right on. Yeah, use, use the, I think they have like a star system or something. Give us all the stars. Yes. Five stars. All the, you know, like you see all those stars when the legendaries pop out. Mm -hmm. Just hand them on over. It's all good. Yep. Uh, yeah, with that, uh, I want to, you know, encourage all of you guys again to check out the live stream for um, the Diablo Tavern talk that will be happening next week, February 10th. That's probably going to be a big part of what we discuss uh, in our show since ours will be the next day. And until then, just follow everything on Diablo.BlizzPro.com. We'll get the outro music and all that good stuff going here. And we'll send you on your way to collecting more loot. More because more, right? More because more. Right on. So yeah, again, also the Twitter exists. If you like to tweet things, feel free to follow uh, the WM Workshop and send us some tweets. Uh, I am usually manning it. I don't know if Nine Ball stops in there sometimes, but you might get a you might get a cheeky response from both both of us. Yes, both of us or none of us. That's or none. Of us. <laughs> you could just know. talk into the void. <laughs> you never know. Uh, but yeah, from both of us here, if you want to follow Nine Ball, that's going to be Nine Ball Gamer on Twitter, and I am Sa Stewart One 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 on Twitter. Uh, the Twitch stream here, of course, twitch.tv slash leviathan111 if you want to come and check us out while we're live. And yeah, Diablo.BlizzPro, all sorts of good stuff there. We have a raid call as well. Um, we have a community in-game for West March Workshop that has that info. If you want to join that without leaving your clan, it's a good place to congregate and talk about the game, talk about strats, get groups for rifts and whatnot. So until next time, use up this goblin buff wisely, and keep on grinding. Keep the grind going on. Give me them goblins. <laughs>